Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dallas Job Seekers Club with Disability Rights Texas discussing COVID-19 and workplace rights. This meeting will be recorded along with the captions and interpretation, and we recommend you keep the presentation at full screen so you can better view the interpreter. If you have any questions, drop them into the chat and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Now I'd like to hand it over to Brian East from Disability Rights Texas. Thank you so much for being with us, Brian. Yes, thank you for inviting me and please let me know if the sound isn't working right. Um, uh, so the uh, host sound kind of dipped for me. Um, but anyway, um, happy to be here and I wanted to talk about um, the rights of individuals with disabilities in the workplace or in applying for a job during the pandemic and the things that that makes more complicated. Um, so the law hasn't changed, but the application of the law to our current circumstances um, can be tricky. So let me um, see if I can advance my slide here. Let's go. Uh, just a few basic points about the law before we get started. One is that each of the laws we're talking about, the ADA, um, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and state law, and I, I generally are referring to all of those as the ADA. But the ADA and these other laws apply to different sets of employers. And so there are employers uh, who are not covered by any of these laws, but most employers are covered by at least one of them. Um, next thing to point out is under the ADA, disability has a particular definition. It's not the same as the definition for social security or uh, other kinds of insurance programs. Um, and um, that can make a difference in certain cases. Um, next point is that the ADA prohibits traditional kind of discrimination, that is treating someone worse because of a disability. But the ADA has an affirmative obligation too, and that is for employers to provide a reasonable workplace accommodation if it's necessary because of limitations caused by a disability. Uh, so those are sort of uh, general points that I'm going to uh, ask that you keep in mind as we go forward. Um, so the first thing I wanted to point out is that there are a bunch of resources on your workplace rights during the pandemic from the EEOC. And at the bottom of the current slide, I have a link to the EEOC's coronavirus page, but you can actually get to it by just going to eeoc.gov. And on that front page, there is a link to their coronavirus page. There is a bunch of things on, the, on that page, um, but um, three of them are uh, particularly helpful in understanding the employee's rights here and the employer's obligations here. Um, but uh, I um, suggest that those of you who are interested, look at those documents that they have. So the topics that they cover in their various guidance documents include uh, appropriate employer screening. So as you may know, when you're applying for a job and before they, they've made a job offer, the employer is very limited in what questions they could ask um, or what medical information they can seek. Uh, so generally they can't do it. Um, and even when someone is a current employee, the employer is limited in what it can ask and when. But the EEOC has said that because of the pandemic and the, um, and the uh, health issues that it raises, um, the employer can do certain screenings that they wouldn't otherwise be allowed to do. So for example, the employer could have a policy of taking the temperature of every employee as they come into the workplace or having the employee themselves do it. That's not something they can normally require when there's no pandemic, but during a pandemic, they can do that. They can also uh, require uh, COVID-19 testing or administer it themselves, but there are some restrictions on it. It has to be the right kind of test and it has to be used in the right way. And one of the things we're seeing now is that the testing, at least some of the testing um, is pretty sophisticated and it can detect 
virus in the body long after the person uh, is infectious to others. And so the CDC uh, has sort of helped us by having guidelines on um, what to do with testing. And they no longer, for example, require that you test negative before you can go back to work or, or leave quarantine. Instead, they require that it be a certain number of days since, since the onset of symptoms or the last symptoms. Um, this is on the CDC website. And so employers can do the testing, but they shouldn't be excluding people until they test positive if that's not what CDC says they should be doing. Um, so again, they can do it, but they have to do it right. Employers can generally have mask policies. Everybody who works here has to wear a mask or, or has to wear a mask if they're not in their own office. Everybody who comes to visit has to wear, our clients, our customers has to wear a mask. Um, so the employer can have those kinds of policies. They can also require that um, uh, people wear gloves or people um, clean surfaces that they touch and provide cleaning products for them. So those are things that are generally okay. Um, there are some exceptions to those, which we'll talk about um, uh, a little bit later. Um, confidentiality is an important piece. Um, and so in general, the employer is not free to share information about a disability with others in the workplace. So if you go to your employer and say, I want you to know I have this disability or I need an accommodation because I have this disability. That's not something that's to be shared with others. Instead, the sort of um, conventional rule is it only should be shared with those who have a need to know it. Um, and that's not everybody. And it's not even your supervisor necessarily. Um, so for example, if uh, someone says that I'm you know, taking leave because of a disability, um, it's possible that the only, that HR gets that information and all they tell the supervisor is this person has approved leave until such and such a date. So again, it's who has a need to know. And this becomes a little more difficult during the pandemic because um, there is an obligation on the employers to report people who test positive or to do contact tracing. Uh, and so uh, what the EEOC is suggesting is it's okay to say something like somebody who works on the third floor uh, and who was in the office you know, last week has tested positive. So if you feel like you've been exposed, you, know, you should get a test. Um, as opposed to saying, Mary Smith has tested positive. So if you think you've been around Mary Smith, um, you should be tested. So again, give it information enough for the person to take appropriate steps, but that doesn't necessarily mean revealing identity. Um, reasonable accommodations we're gonna talk about in a minute. I've already mentioned that the ADA requires them and there are some particular ones that are in play during the pandemic, we'll talk about it. And then also mentioned on the EEOC materials is when can the employer exclude employees from the workplace? So there's a lot of uh, information about if you test positive or if you're in quarantine or should be in quarantine because you've been ex you have a known exposure. Um, but there's also information about what if you're just worried about someone in the workplace uh, because of a condition they have and you're worried that they might get really sick if they get COVID-19. So there's guidance about that. Uh, so that's sort of the kinds of information that you can get from the EEOC and it is helpful. Um, some of the things that are okay for the employee employer to do of current employees is, as I mentioned, taking the temperature, asking about known symptoms, asking about absences or known exposures, requiring quarantining if the person has COVID-19 or symptoms, uh, requiring infection control practices, requiring the use of PPE and technically the, the cloth masks that we are all typically wearing a lot these days are not PPE. PPE is usually a term that refers to more technical kinds of protection, um, but I'll just use it more generally here to talk about any kind of protective device, including cloth masks. Um, 
and then encouraging getting an available vaccine. So we don't have one now, we hope to have one um, and the employer can encourage staff to get one. Um, uh, what about applicants? Uh, how are they impacted here? So again, well, not again, but um, once the employer has made a job offer, so they've uh, reviewed their resumes, they've conducted their um, interviews, and they've decided they want to offer Mary the position, and they do offer it, it can be contingent on medical information. That's the law generally under the ADA, and it's the law during the pandemic. So um, shouldn't be talking about until the offer, but once there is an offer, then you can uh, ask about medical conditions. Um, and you have to keep it confidential and you have to ask of it of everybody who's, who's uh, entering the, the job, entering that same job type or job class. So you can't just pick out who you're gonna ask these medical questions to. It has to be a policy that you ask everyone once you've made an offer. And you shouldn't be asking it before you make an offer. Um, so if you're the applicant, um, you should be, you know, you should realize that they're not supposed to ask you any questions about medical stuff or your disability until they've offered you a position. And it can be contingent on things. It can be contingent on medical information, but it can't be contingent on anything else. Um, and then uh, the employer can withdraw a job offer if the person has COVID-19 and the job requires starting immediately. So the EEOC is telling us that. Um, what are some things the employer cannot do? Um, so one thing that we worry employers are gonna do, we have not seen too much of it yet, um, but we worry that employers are gonna start asking everybody do you have any of these conditions on the CDC list of risk factors? And those include things like diabetes, cystic fibrosis, uh, sickle cell disease, various things. Um, so the employer is not supposed to just start asking people about that. Um, so they may already know the person has a risk factor because they probably know the age of the employee and that could create a risk factor. Um, or maybe it's been shared before, maybe the person is public about the information, maybe they've asked for an accommodation in the past so the employer knows about it. So they may have this information, but they're not supposed to just go asking people about it. Um, and then what about if we have a vaccine, can they force employees to take it? So the answer is sort of, um, so there are exceptions that they can say, I mean, if you wanna keep working here, you have to take a vaccine. But they also have to allow for exceptions if someone has a medical condition that prevents doing that safely, and then not not about the disability, not about the ADA. But the person may also have a religious objection, and they have to accommodate that. Um, so there are some exceptions to sort of forced taking of the vaccine. Um, and then another so. These are the kind of cases that we either are seeing or we were expecting to see, or we see in other parts of the country. And the first one, the most common situation that we are seeing and that we expect to see is someone who has a disability that is a risk factor for a serious case of COVID-19 if they get it, and therefore is asking for a reasonable accommodation to reduce that risk. Uh, so that's the most common situation that we are seeing. Um, another kind of um, case is um, firing someone because they're making an accommodation request or because they need one. So this sounds like the same thing. It's a little bit different legally, but same kind of thing. So a bad reaction to a request for accommodation during the pandemic. Um, and then something we are worried about is whether the employer is going to start furloughing or firing or um, taking other action against people because they know they have a risk factor. So are the employers going to start saying everybody who's age 65 or over, we're going to let you go, or we're going to put you on unpaid leave for the next six months. Um, that would be illegal under the Age Discrimination Act. Um, they could do the same kind of thing on the basis of disability. So 
you're not asking for anything, but they know you have a disability, they're worried about you or claim to be, and therefore they're going to let you go. We haven't seen too much of that yet, so hopefully we won't. Um, so, um, and then the other kind of case that we didn't necessarily expect, but we're starting to see is employers who claim to be firing people because uh, their employee, employee exposed others to COVID-19. And certainly that could be a justifiable excuse in certain circumstances, but sometimes the person has not in fact exposed others to COVID-19 and therefore it could be sort of covering up something else or in some other way, discrimination. So those are what we are sort of expecting to see. Let me talk a little bit about accommodations. So first of all, why might they be needed? And the one we've mentioned before, and I think the most common thing we're seeing is because someone has a disability that is recognized as putting them at higher risk for serious illness um, should they get COVID-19. Um, so again, let's say type two diabetes, just to pick one, there's, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 now on the CDC list. Um, and there, and it's incomplete because we're still, the science is moving forward and identifying these things. Um, but anyway, someone who has a disability that is a risk factor may need an accommodation to try to avoid that risk or minimize that risk. A person might also need an accommodation because they have a mental disability and the pandemic is exacerbating, making their symptoms worse, um, triggering various uh, kinds of uh, problems. Um, and so they need an accommodation um, because of the way it's impacting their mental disability. Um, we are seeing some of that. Um, another kind of accommodation might be to make other accommodations more accessible. So at the beginning of all this, when so much of the workplace be started working remotely, so let's say in, in March or April uh, in this country, um, the employer was saying, okay, everybody, you know, work from home. And there are people who have a disability that requires them to have um, accommodations to make that work. A uh, different kind of screen reader technology, different kind of hardware, making sure um, sign language interpreters are available for meetings, um, various kinds of things. So, um, so, sort of making sure that the changes that we're making in the workplace are available to everyone equally. Accommodations are not required though because of the risk factor of a family or household member. So let me repeat that and I'm gonna actually say that a little bit different way. The ADA and disability discrimination laws do not require an accommodation because an individual is able to work themselves, may not have a risk factor, but they're living with someone or they're caring for someone who has a risk factor and they don't wanna bring it home. So this is a place where the ADA has a gap and a lot of people have asked us about this. And uh, we have to tell them that you can certainly ask the employer to make these accommodations, to let you work from home uh, or whatever else needs to happen to minimize the risk to the grandparent, the child with a disability, et cetera. But the ADA itself doesn't require it. Um, so that's sort of a gap in these laws we're, we're talking about. Another problem that can come up is someone who says, I'm worried about getting COVID-19. I don't have a disability that makes me particularly at risk. Um, and I don't live with anybody like that, um, but I'm just worried about it. I read all these stories and you know, I don't wanna get sick. Um, so can I work from home? Again, uh, in that sort of example, um, the person doesn't have a disability at all. They do have a worry and it may be a very reasonable or rational worry. It's not a question of that. Um, but if they have no disability themselves um, and they're just worried about getting one or getting an illness, um, the ADA doesn't really help 
there. All right, um, types of accommodations. So um, this is probably something a lot of people are aware of. And there was this you know, sort of big social experiment since the spring when a big part of the economy moved to remote working, teleworking. And so what we've seen is there are a lot of jobs that cannot be done remotely. So if your job is to physically move items or physically uh, touch things uh, or um, you know, dig things or hang things, um, that's, uh, that's often not, not possible right now. Uh, to be done remotely. So there's a big sector of the economy that cannot telework. Um, but a lot of other people have uh, been teleworking now. Uh, and many of them were forced to do it, whether they wanted to or not. Um, some of them are uh, now being allowed to do it, or the employer is continuing to require it. Um, or maybe the employer is allowing a choice now to come back and some employers are requiring people to come back. So um, the big question in, in any accommodation is, will it allow the employee to do the essential functions of the job? And often in these cases, we have a difference of agreement with the employer about that. The employer is saying, you got to come back to work now, we've reopened and your job can't be done remotely. And we're often of the position that yes, it can. Um, not only has it been done for several weeks remotely, it's been done successfully, but there's no reason why it can't be or no good reason. Um, so that's the big question. When there's a fight about teleworking, the big question is often, what are the essential functions and can they be done remotely? Um, so that's, we're seeing a lot of that. Another very common accommodation generally, uh, so even before the pandemic, is a period of leave. Someone needs leave to get treatment or therapy, go into the hospital, or because they're sick, they're having a, um, a period of illness from their underlying disability, et cetera. Um, and that's generally thought of as a reasonable accommodation. And the problems come in if the leave is really long or if the leave is indefinite. That is, we don't know how long it, the person needs it for. So before the pandemic, when someone would come to us and say, I need to ask for leave, but I'm sort of worried, how do I do it? One of the things we would advise them is to ask their medical caregiver um, to give an estimated date when they can come back. Um, so, so the employer knows roughly how long it is, and that this is not indefinite. This is not like permanent, who knows when or if, none of that kind of stuff. It's like until, you know, November 12th. Um, so, so that kind of thing works when someone is needing to, you know, isolate because of an exposure. And, you know, we're talking about a short period of time. But what if someone says, I want to take leave until this is over? it's hard to know when this is over, when that will be. Um, so again, many employers are being flexible now. They realize the problems with this um, and they are allowing people to take a period of unpaid leave without losing their job, knowing that there may be pandemic relief law benefits that they can get uh, or other kinds of benefits they can get in the meantime. But the expectation is um, we'll get over this and then they can come back. So leave is a little bit difficult when, during, when it's specifically related to the pandemic. But there are lots of other accommodations and accommodations are really um, a place for all of us to be creative, the employee uh, or allies of the employee, but also the employer. You know, we, we can all sort of strategize together about what might help. You know, what, are, what are the manifestations of the disability that need to be addressed? and how might they be addressed? And then will those work here? Um, so as many of you may know, if you Google JAN, J-A-N, you get to the website of the Job Accommodation Network. And this organization is federally funded. 
Um, and it has a lot of really good information about the kinds of accommodations that might be reasonable. Um, so sometimes an employer approaches me, says I'm having these kind of problems, but I don't know what to ask for. And so we might look at a, uh, an information sheet that Jan has about that particular condition or a similar condition, a condition with similar uh, manifestations or sim similar limitations. Um, and we look at that and we say, well, you know, here's something that they're suggesting as a possibility and the person might say, no, that won't work for me um, or it won't work in this workplace. And then, you know, how about this? Yeah, that might work. So it can be a way for the individual to come up with suggestions and it could also be a information to the employer. So sometimes our clients will actually print out a document and send it to or hand it to or email it to um, the workplace saying, I need an accommodation. Here's some information about my condition and possible accommodations. And the one I'm seeking or the ones I'm seeking are A, B, and C. Um, so with regard to the pandemic, um, some of the things we're seeing are some of the alternative accommodations. So the person has to come back to work. Let's say that's all agreed. They can't do the job remotely. They have to come back to work. So what, what else could, could we do if they have a risk factor disability, for example? Um, so again, make sure that there's a mask policy that it's enforced, uh, provide face shields and gloves and that kind of thing to employees, um, create physical barriers or put them in a separate office or allow them to shut their door even though the standard policy is an open door one. Um, changing schedules so people don't interact as much, uh, putting the person who has a risk factor disability in a different office that is more remote from others. Um, so that they don't have to interact or is next to the bathroom so they don't have to walk down, you know, um, 200 feet of corridor several times a day because of their disability. Um, disinfection policies, hygiene policies, um, and there are lots of resources related to these kinds of things on the CDC website, the World Health Organization, and OSHA. The CDC has a particular document that is helpful for many people that is about pandemic or COVID-19 um, changes for office buildings. And it talks about many of the things on this slide, but it also talks about changes to the heating and air conditioning system, opening windows, um, installing filtration devices, lots of things. So, um, so I mentioned, you know, I had a slide about teleworking and, uh, and about leave. Um, but really, you know, it, it's up to our creativity to come up with ways around this. It's always up to our creativity on this point, um, but it, particularly at this time, um, you know, I think it's important that we do that. Um, so the last slide I have is just, it just has links and, and hopefully this will either be repeated in the chat box or this slideshow will be made available um, to folks, but these are links to material that we have on our own website. Um, uh, the first one is a Q&A about workers' rights generally. This was written before the pandemic, is not about the pandemic, um, but it's just generally how your rights work, what you can do, where to get more information, how to file a complaint. The second one is specific to workers' rights during the pandemic, and it has a lot of the information that we've talked about today. The third one is about mask policies at work. So I mentioned that uh, we talk about mask policies. So where it comes an issue is when, um, so in general, an employer can require masks be worn. Um, but what if someone has a disability that prevents them from wearing a mask or they have a disability that um, requires them to be able to, let's say, see facial expressions or read lips because they're hard of hearing and people wearing a mask, not themselves so much, but other people wearing a mask prevents them from communicating in the way they normally do. So, so what this probably means is that doesn't mean you get to go in without a mask because that could create a risk for others. But it does mean that the employer has to think of other solutions. Um, if you can't wear a mask, Maybe you are allowed to telework. Maybe there are alternative masks you can wear. 
maybe there's some sort of distancing or isolation that will work for everybody. Um, so the fact that you may uh, not be able to wear a mask or that masks may prevent communication or interaction in some way doesn't mean no one has to wear a mask, but it does mean people are gonna think about a way around, around it. Uh, the last link on this page is how to contact us uh, to get help. So um, the, the library did share with me a couple of questions before in the days past related to this presentation. One of them was, do you have an office in Lubbock? And the answer is yes. But in addition to that, we take cases from all over the state. So if you're in a location where we don't have an office like Amarillo or Waco or other places, um, that doesn't mean you can't uh, seek our services. So right now our offices are generally closed to the public and most of us are working remotely, um, but we're still taking cases and we still have an intake uh, service. And, and that last link there um, shows you. Um, and our website uh, you can get to by www.drtx.org. And there you can look for the kinds of cases we take, um, how we're funded, where our offices are, various other kinds of information. And there is a coronavirus link on our front page as well. And it takes you to the handouts um, um, in the second and third bullet point here, but a whole bunch of other handouts about education and different um, uh, things that may arise during the pandemic. So um, I'm, I'm uh, looking at my list of the questions that were uh, asked before the, the presentation. One was, um, can you require telework? Can, can uh, the employee um, get telework if they have a risk factor disability? So we've talked about that. And the answer generally is yes. But again, it depends. Can you do the essential functions with that accommodation? And if the answer is no, it might still be reasonable for a period of time or reasonable uh, if done part-time um, or reasonable if other things are done instead. Um, so, but yes, the answer is um, teleworking may be a reasonable accommodation for a risk factor disability. Um, can the employer prevent you from seeing your doctor during the pandemic? No, um, nothing allows them to do that. So for example, if you have a right under the Family and Medical Leave Act to take some time off to get treatment for a condition, you have that same right. Now, some doctors may not be seeing patients in person, um, so maybe it is now telemed kind of thing, but in general, um, the employer has no greater right to forbid you to see your doctor now during the pandemic. Um, we've talked about confidentiality, about your disability or about having COVID-19. Um, there was another question, can the employer um, force us to sign a waiver if they know, for example, we have a disability that's a risk factor, we wanna to come to work, we're willing to come to work. They say they'll let us, but they want us to sign a waiver of liability. So our, our general answer is they, they should not do that. But often we will tell our clients, you know, if, if that's what they're requiring, uh, for you to keep your job, then maybe as a practical matter, you want to do it rather than draw a line in the sand. So those are all the questions that I got in advance. Um, and I hope there's some other questions uh, that I, uh, and if there are, I hope I can answer them. Um, but uh, feel free to ask on any topic that relates to disability and work. Um, I put my contact information on this last slide, but i um, happy to hear. And I guess you're supposed to um, uh, ask your question in the chat box if that's possible. All right, Brian, it looks like we have one question so far. Um, what if an employer does not know how to provide a reasonable accommodation? They're not outright refusing, but don't have any experience with providing accommodations in the past. What then? Yeah, so this does come up. And, and the key thing here is sort of reasonableness. 
So what the EEOC and the courts have said is delaying too long is the same as denying an accommodation. So it's not okay for the employer to sit on it too long. On the other hand, if they, uh, for example, if the person says, I need to telework and the employer says, that makes sense. We think we can probably do it, but we don't have any of that tech yet. So we're gonna bring in someone to tell us what we need, to tell us how to make your, um, your workstation at home secure uh, or your, your uh, internet connection secure, whatever else we need to do. And that'll take us, you know, a week or two. Um, that's, you know, that's likely going to be seen as okay. It also depends on how much of an emergency this is. So um, if, you know, if, if they're saying, you know, we'll just keep working at, in the office until we can kind of figure out this telework thing, um, that may not be appropriate if your doctor is saying, because of your condition, you are at many times greater risk of death or serious injury if you get COVID-19. Um, so, you know, uh, putting you on paid leave um, or other kinds of things are typically done by employers that are, you know, have the right attitude about this. Um, and so it can be, it can take a while to work out. Um, just like even before the pandemic, someone might need a certain kind of chair or a certain kind of workstation. And the employer is not saying no, but it takes them a while to get it. You know, we have to do this work order and then our department comes down and inspects. And, you know, it, it just all depends how long we're talking. Um, so unfortunately, we see cases where the employer says, yeah, yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to get right on that. And six months later, nothing's happened. Um, and the courts don't like that. The courts hold that against the employer. Um, so it's okay that the employer doesn't know what to do right away, but they need to figure it out pretty quickly. Um, and the job accommodation network is one way to do it. Um, these days, questions about telework, there's lots of resources around that and probably any other business, you know, in the same building or the same block has figured it out. Um, so there, there are ways to get that information. Hope, hope that was helpful. Thanks, Brian. Um, we've got a participant asking about a situation here in the chat um, where an employer will not allow the employee to see their doctor and forces them to stay home. The employer has done a poll asking about medical conditions when they said they would ask nothing more regarding um, medical conditions um, listed on the CDC. Um, and finally, they, the employee was told they were 63 years of age and at high risk, so they must go home to work at a cost to them. How does an employee handle these kinds of demands? Yeah, so a lot of things there. Um, the, with regard to the last one, let's say, the, so this is not really disability related directly, but the employer says, you're an older worker, I see on the CDC webpage that puts you at increased risk, which it does. And therefore, um, I'm gonna force you to work from home. That, um, that seems like employment discrimination. The key to me would be, how is this impacting the individual? So is this just something they don't like? They would prefer to be in the office to kind of miss um, talking to people, that kind of thing. Or is it costing them something? So the example given, it was costing them something to set it up, but it was also, but it might also cost them other things. They don't have the same kind of contact. They lose promotional opportunity. There could be various things that are wrong with forcing someone to work from home because of a protected classification and age is a protected classification. So that might be a violation there. Um, I already um, forgot the rest of the question. So there were, I know there were three examples. Oh, one was about the doctor. So I don't really understand what's going on there with the employer saying you can't go to your doctor. It's possible that the employer is fearful that you going to your doctor might expose you in some way. And so they don't want you going to your doctor. 
um, that is inappropriate for a lot of reasons, um, not the least of which is, you know, if anybody is going into the office, if you are going to the HEB to shop, there's exposure possibilities all over for all of us. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of picking one possible route of exposure and perhaps one of the least likely. Um, now, it's another thing if, um, you know, you, you were caring for someone uh, and you, you know, you were led into the COVID ward and you were there for several hours, they might want you to quarantine to make sure you, even though you had an N95 mask and a face shield and a gown and gloves, they might ask you to do that kind of thing. But I don't really understand the motivation behind you can't see your doctor and don't think they can do it. Um, and then the middle question, uh, I forgot what that was. I'm looking right now. Um, oh, it says the employer has done a poll asking about medical conditions and said they would ask nothing more regarding the employee's medical conditions listed on right. the CDC. Yeah, so I kind of went over that a little bit. The, the key here is, um, do they have a good reason to ask? And the EEOC is saying that um, just thinking that someone might have a risk factor is not a good enough reason to ask. Um, so, so I don't totally understand the question, but if, for example, the employer says, I've written down a list of everything the CDC says is a definite risk factor or a probable or possible risk factor, you need to tell me if you have any of these things. Um, I don't think they can do it. It also sounded like in this example that they said that's all they were going to do, but then they ended up asking about any kind of medical condition or a wide, you know, a wide uh, breadth of medical conditions. Do you have, um, you know, bipolar disorder? Do you have, you know, just, just anything? Um, and they certainly can't do that. So one of the things I should probably say is, so what if they are doing something that I've told you they're not supposed to do? What can you do about it? So we often ask, we often suggest that you talk to the employer about it um, and uh, you know, document that you've called their attention to the fact that you don't think they're supposed to do this. Um, but if they just ignore you, or if they say, we don't care what you think, or if they say, tell us that one more time and you're fired, then the next step in these cases is to file a complaint of discrimination with the EEOC or the Texas Workforce Commission's Civil Rights Division or one of three um, local uh, fair employment offices um, if you happen to be in Austin, Fort Worth or Corpus. Um, and so you file the complaint what happens is they write it up or you, if you, you haven't written it up for them, um, they share it with the employer, they ask the employer's position and they're supposed to investigate. Um, and sometimes that resolves the issue and sometimes it doesn't. It's against the law for the employer to retaliate against you for filing that kind of complaint, but that doesn't mean it never happens, it does happen. And so you should be thinking about that so when someone comes to us and they've done all the things they're supposed to do and they're like, I don't know what else to do, you may be able to get a lawyer to write a letter, um, but the next step is going to the EEOC. And you can't, in these cases, you generally cannot just go straight to court. There may be exceptions if there's an emergency, but in general, you have to go to the EEOC or one of these other organizations and let them investigate first before you can go to court. Um, whether you want to or not. It, it can be a useful process, but whether it's useful or not, you have to do it in most cases. There are some exceptions, but in most cases. So I hope that somehow somewhere in there answered the question. Thank you so much. Very thorough answer, lots to think about. Um, we are coming to the end of our time today. We've got a few more questions. Wondering if you can say um, a little bit about them and then we'll wrap up. Um, the first one here um, that has been asked a couple of times is how can you guys help an employee versus the EEOC, which I'm not. 
Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but typically what we do, someone contacts us and they're, they're asking these same kind of questions. What are my rights here? We may give them advice and that may be all they need and they are successful or they work out something they're okay with. So, you know, they, they're, you know, sort of starting out, what are my rights? Then they may ask us to contact the employer directly, which we may or may not do. We do these kinds of cases, but as you might guess, we get way more of them than we can take. So uh, we, we do take some. Um, and we also may help the employee file a complaint with the EEOC. And then let's say they've done all that and the EEOC process is over and they need, they, and nothing is resolved. Um, so we may take, we may file a lawsuit uh, against the employer. Um, so it's sort of, you know, direct advocacy by yourself, possibly getting a lawyer to help, going to the EEOC, and if all that fails and you still want to do something, the next step, the last step is a lawsuit. Um, so those are, that's sort of the process. Thanks for explaining that. Um, and then I have one more question. And just to everyone else who might have a question at this point, um, I will be emailing everybody who registered for this event and um, putting in contact information for Brian and Disability Rights Texas so um, you can get in touch um, and also access the resources that Brian um, gave us today. So the last question here before um, I wrap up, um, for deaf and hard of hearing people, having everyone wear masks has been difficult to say the least and makes communicating a challenge. What are your thoughts on this briefly? Um, how can employers provide accommodations for us to be continuing continue to perform our essential duties, especially if it requires interaction with the public? Yes. So um, it, th there's not an easy answer to this. There are masks that have a clear window. That can help if the issue is I communicate in part by facial expression and by re lip reading. Um, and I'm not able to do that because my supervisor is wearing a mask, which they're required to do, and I can't, I can't follow along. Um, so that's one possibility. Sometimes face shields are acceptable. They're not, I mean, that are accepted by employers. They are not as um, protective as a mask, um, but that can help. Um, but we're, the other thing that we, you know, that is sort of a negative in this way is that sign language interpreting is obviously really key and few jobs require the person to have a full-time uh, sign language interpreter for them, but jobs often require the employer to bring in a sign language interpreter for important meetings and trainings and various things. Um, um, so, and, and there was a time at least when, um, when a lot of the interpreting agencies weren't providing live in person, not live, they weren't providing in-person interpreters. So my sense is that varies. Some of them do provide it now uh, and maybe always did. Um, and so, you know, but if that's a problem, then a remote interpreter, VRI, um, uh, video remote interpreting might uh, work um, putting things in writing might work for some people if they're proficient in English and not everybody who's deaf um, is proficient enough in English that, that that's a comfortable interaction for them. It really just depends on the nature of the communication and the nature of the person's abilities. Um, one of the things we were pushing for before the pandemic was for entities to realize that some people have no problem doing video remote interpreting and communicating that way, and others have a real problem understanding when it's not live 3D in person. Um, and unfortunately, at least during this pandemic, um, we, can't, we can't push that uh, in the same way we did before, because the, the problems for people are exactly the same as they've always been. Some people, this doesn't work very well for them, um, but now, um, there are reasons why remote interpreting uh, might be required. 
So um, I've also, we've also had examples of people uh, for whom the accommodation is taking off the mask to communicate, but like doing it outside and standing, you know, 12 feet apart, something like that. Um, so uh, outside's a lot safer than inside, distance is a lot safer than close, and short periods of time is a lot safer than either long periods or we're now seeing, as of yesterday, repeated periods over a course of a day. Um, so there's no good answer to that. It is, a, it is a problem, but it's one that we all just need to strategize with and do the best we can to ensure that there is effective communication in the workplace for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Thank you so much um, for, for all of that detail. Um, and I wanted to thank you again, Brian, for coming and, and sharing all of that great information with us today for Dallas Job Seekers Club. For those of you who are new with us today, um, Dallas Job Seekers Club meets every week, Thursdays at 1 p.m. Um, to discuss topics in job seeking and provide resources and connections in the community for anyone um, on that job seeking path. So I wanted to just give you a brief um, overview of some of the resources that we provide, um, and then I will let you go. So give me just a minute to share my screen. All right, so this is our website here, and I will post this link in the chat and send it to you on the um, email afterwards as well. But you can see here, we have one more program coming up in October, um, and that is our Ask a Career Coach series, and we'll be talking about resumes. So if that is of interest to, to you or anyone you know, please click here and um, you'll be able to register. We also have a newsletter and I'll give you um, this link as well. It goes out every Monday and with resources and um, lots of helpful links. We post our recorded events here. So here you can see past um, job seekers events with various topics. We also list job flyers and then other general um, employment resources, especially for those affected by coronavirus. Um, we also encourage you to follow us on LinkedIn. We also post there pretty frequently with a lot of good resources um, and links to upcoming programs. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Um, and I will make sure to get, oh, sorry, my dog was just shaking. <laughs> um, but I will uh, make sure to get you all of these links um, in the email. Um, after this event ends. And thank you everyone for, um, Alicia, thank you for putting in the um, website here and then our LinkedIn right here. And I'll get that to everybody there as well. Um, but thank you everyone for coming today. We really appreciate you um, coming out and spending an hour of your afternoon with us. Um, and thanks again to uh, Brian, our presenter, Chanel, our interpreter, and Susan, our transcriptionist. Really appreciate all that you did for us this hour. Um, we look forward to connecting with, with all of you here in the future. Um, thanks again for attending. <laughs>